But welcome, bienvenidos to today's core training on developing your programmatic approach and evaluation strategy. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today. And as you can hear, today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and will also translate any written comments and questions from the chat. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which will be provided by Stella Lauerman. I will turn it over to Nicole Young, who's going to give us an overview of the uh, core investments framework. Thanks, Nicole. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, and it's both a funding model and a broader effort or movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And so we like to, uh, to share that definition of CORE as well as the mission and vision because together those are a key part of what we call the core framework. So the mission and vision statement that are shown on the screen really focus on equity, collective action, this broader vision of an equitable, thriving and resilient community. And that was developed uh, through a very collaborative approach, the statements that you see here. And the other key part of the core framework are the core conditions for health and well-being that you see on this slide here. Uh, and when we say words like equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan need to have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interconnected core conditions. And that we want to get to a place where people's opportunities and their life outcomes and their quality of life aren't predictable for better or for worse by race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, or other social identities. So when we think of CORE as both a funding model and a broader movement, it really provides us this framework to align our priorities, our programs, our policies, our funding, and our results around community-wide goals in these eight areas of well-being. And we put equity at the center to illustrate and to remind ourselves, we have to constantly examine and address our individual, our organizational, our systemic beliefs and practices and structures, because very often they are the things that are perpetuating the inequities that we're actually trying to eliminate. And we're gonna highlight a couple um, definitions here that we think will be really good to go to keep going back to as you're preparing your core funding applications. One is the County of Santa Cruz's equity statement, which was re recently adopted. So the statement reads, equity in, in action in Santa Cruz County is a transformative process that embraces individuals of every status, providing unwavering support, dignity, and compassion. Through this commitment, the county ensures intentional opportunities and access, fostering an environment where everyone can thrive and belong. So a lot of similarities with the core mission and vision. And then also in the RFP, you'll see at the very, I think it's the very end of the doc document, somewhere near the end of the document, a glossary with several words that are used throughout the RFP and then a definition. So you can really try to understand what does the county mean when they say these words or use these words in the RFP. So here is the definition of equity in the glossary. Fairness or justice in the way people are treated, specifically freedom from bias or favoritism. And a program that's built on equity will address the needs of specific populations that are most likely to be affected by inequities by providing resources and opportunities such that they may thrive alongside other residents in the county. So again, key definitions to keep in mind as you're preparing your applications. And events like today's training, we're offering as part of the Core Institute for Impact or the Core Institute. So you might know we think of that as the learning arm of Core Investments, where we offer a variety of training, technical assistance, capacity building events. Right now, we're offering these that are really focused on the Core 
funding process, but we also, even when there's not an active application process happening, we offer a variety of learning events to continuously build our collective capacity and, and knowledge and skills to really fulfill that vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. Couple of things we just wanna point out, if you haven't already found it, uh, there are a couple of different places on the county's website and the human services department's website where you can find the RFP and all the information related to dates, timelines, who to contact for what. So I just wanna point that out here as well as on the next slide, several key dates to keep in mind leading up to the application due date on August 2nd. Um, there are several other key dates listed in the RFP uh, that you should also <laughs> be aware of, keep track of, but we just wanted to highlight these that are coming up uh, in the next couple months. And as you probably already know, for this RFP, the board and the city council are inviting proposals that address specific core conditions and impact statements. So focusing on lifelong learning and education, thriving families and healthy environments, the funding that's been allocated for stable, afford stable affordable housing and shelter, uh, that will be handled through a separate process. We don't have any, we still don't have any information about that at this point. So those, that's definitely a question for the county if you're interested in that. What we can offer or what we are offering right now are a variety of types of training and technical assistance to organizations that are applying for core funding. So between Nicole Lezen, Crystal Caballero and myself will be offering these, um, you know, everything from these more structured trainings on a specific topic where we're offering different kind of skills and resources to help you the more informal office hours where you just bring any questions you have, we try to talk through them as a group. And then the more individualized uh, TA sessions where you can request up to two sessions per application. And just our quick uh, reminder in terms of what our role is as the training and TA providers, uh, we're here to provide resources, information, more like coaching guidance. If you have questions about, well, how do I answer this? How do I go about thinking about this? We can provide that kind of coaching guidance to you, but are really going to try to stay away from saying anything that sounds like, you should do this, you should say this, don't do this, don't, <laughs> that we don't wanna be telling you what you can or can't do or should or shouldn't apply for, or how you say it or don't say it, but really help you kind of arrive at your own answers so that it feels like it's the best fit and approach for your own organization. Okay, so at this point, we'd like to do is launch a quick poll just to get a sense of what your current thinking is. So we're interested if you, if you have a, a, an idea yet, which core condition or conditions and impact statement or statements are you considering applying for? What are you considering submitting applications for? Lifelong learning and education, Thriving Families, the one focused on increased resilience of children and youth, or Thriving Families, the one focused on increased resilience among older and dependent adults, healthy environments, or you're not sure yet. Just kind of let us know what's what's on the top of your mind now. It looks like we might have all the responses. So I'm just gonna end the poll, share the results. So kind of a, a, a smattering of, of things. So lifelong learning and education, thriving families, children, youth, and the healthy environments. Okay, that gives us a, just a helpful sense of what kinds of things you might be thinking of or wondering about as we go through the training content today. And so speaking of, here's our agenda for today. So we will do a brief walkthrough just to orient ourselves to what are the questions in the RFP that today's training uh, will help you um, address? And so we'll we'll just we're not gonna we'll just show you which questions we think this training will help you answer as you're preparing your application, and then we have some specific tips and tools and resources that we'll walk you through. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. 
Okay, so just starting with a really high level view of the RFP at the sections in the RFP in the application, uh, and then this, the portions we'll be focusing on today. Uh, we also recommend like keep going back to this table. It's listed in a couple different places in the RFP just to remind yourself, okay, what are the sections? Where might I be answering or providing information about my program? Because sometimes you might find that you're, you're doing it in a couple different sections and then pay attention to, okay, so what, what is the relative importance or weight of that section? So we can see that statement of needs and strengths, the why do it, that comes first. We focused on that in our uh, training that we did last Friday. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on uh, tips and tools that can help you uh, address the sections about proposed approach, what should be done, and who do you intend to serve. So notice that proposed approach, what should be done, that section actually uh, has the most points assigned to it. So that means it's really important that you're crafting <laughs> comprehensive, thorough, compelling, clear response there. Um, and then your post, proposed approach, who do you intend to serve? Uh, and then following that capacity to provide services and program budget. So we'll be offering other trainings that loosely mirror these uh, sections and the order of the sections in the application. But again, today we're focusing on the proposed approach. The other tip that we have that we keep repeating is um, Keep, you know, as you're filling out your application, drafting your responses, like keep studying and going back to and comparing the questions in the application, your responses with the scoring scale, the scoring rubric. Um, and we'll we'll look at that at a couple different points also, uh, I think in today's training in terms of really understanding okay, what what will the reviewers be looking for in an exemplary response? And then what might some of the other, you know, if, if you find that you don't get an exemplary score on your response, what might be some of the reasons why? So we'll look at kind of that, that scale. So our general tip is just, just keep paying attention to that, keep studying that. And now we'll move on and just do a quick review of, again, what are the questions in the application in these two sections about your proposed approach? So the first set of questions are about what should be done. And if you're trying to find where these questions are actually listed in the application or in the RFP, um, these are on pages 29 and 30 of the RFP. So you're gonna be asked questions like, describe in detail the program or service you're proposing. And as part of that response, you're being asked to address, to describe how that program will address the inequities contributing to the need, challenge, or issue that you've described and how it relates to your selected core condition and impact statement. And you can see that that question alone is worth 10 points. And then we've also listed, you know, and this is copied directly from the RFP, the character limits, including spaces. You will also have to decide and answer where your program fits on that core investments continuum of results and evidence. So that's a tool that we'll actually review today to help you, even though that question is not scored, uh, it, we're hoping that today's content in the, in the training can help you understand like how to use that tool to be able to answer the question. This is the information in Spanish. And then we'll move to the next question because the other big part of this question about your proposed approach is explaining the key activities you will provide as part of your proposed program. The activities need to align to your program description and your statement of needs and strengths. So basically tying it back to questions you will have already answered in the application. And so you have to describe not only what the activity or service is, but how it will make an impact on the needs and strengths you've identified. And then you also have to provide some quantitative, some you know total number of activities that you plan to provide over the contract term and actually which fiscal year those activities will happen. Again, the next slide shows it in Spanish. And then the last question in this section here, I believe it's the last one, uh, about what should be done. You just have to then um, 
describe for the county and the city how you plan to provide how you plan to collect the client satisfaction survey data that will be required by the end of each fiscal year. So the county provides the survey, um, they develop the questions, you just have to give them a sense of how you'll go about implementing that survey so that you can report on the data in your year end report every year. So that's question nine. And the question in Spanish. And then, sorry, this is the last question in this section here about what should be done. This is where you have to provide up to three outcome measures or statements that you're going to be tracking and measuring to show the impact or the results of the program or service that you're pr proposing. Couple key things here also that you need to link it back to the core condition and impact statement that you plan to address and use what we're calling the SMARTY format. So it's specific, measurable, action-oriented, relevant, time-bound, inclusive, and equitable. So again, we'll go through some tips and tools today about how to, how to create SMARTY outcomes or objectives. And then the next section, so again, you'll see the question in Spanish. Then the next section about your proposed approach is who you intend to serve. So here you'll see in the application, there's just a whole bunch of like tables basically that you have to fill out where you're estimating some demographics, some client counts. Go to the next slide, you'll see that again in Spanish. And then I'm just going to quickly touch on what the remaining questions are. So question 12, again, some more demographic categories where you just have to fill in some tables with your best estimates. The next slide shows that same question in Spanish. Then question 13. And I think this is the almost the last one in this section here. Um, so you have to do your best to estimate like what your unduplicated client counts will be for in terms of who you'll serve with core funding only. Okay. So a lot of this is just kind of projecting, it's basically answering the question, how much will you do? Okay. Um, and then this last one here is same thing, estimating the percent of or the client counts that you anticipate serving based on um, the federal poverty levels. And there it is again in Spanish. Okay, so there's a lot of, so you can see why those two sections really, I mean, they represent almost half of the total points that can be awarded for an application. So it means like these two sections together are really important. And so our, we've got a few different, um, again, tips and tools here, but one of our, um, <laughs> we probably sound like a broken record to a lot of people. We are, we are big believers in developing a theory of change and a logic model. Um, even though this application does not require you, the funder is not requiring you to submit a theory of change and logic model, going through the, the step or the exercise, particularly with other colleagues or coworkers or community members that are participants in your program, going through that process of developing a theory of change and logic model can really then help you answer some of the questions that are being asked in this RFP. And in particular, the questions about what should be done. Question six is asking you to describe your program and service. Question eight, where you have to describe your activities. Question 10, where you have to provide the smarty outcomes. If you've done that work um, together or on your own even to develop the theory of change and logic model, you'll have a lot of your answers. You might still have to you know, do more work to turn them into a narrative but that um, you'll be able to better articulate what it is that should be done, as well as who you intend to serve. So those questions about your participants, demographics, you, know, you might still have to do some work to estimate numbers or percentages to fill out those tables, but doing a theory of change in the logic model will um, 
will definitely, we think, be able to help help you get started. And in fact, I know some of you were there. Oops, we probably need to click advance a few times, Nicole, to make all the boxes appear. <laughs> there we go. Um, and you know, some of you know we we recently did a training on developing a theory of change and logic model with an equity lens. So we're not going to go into detail on that again today, but just wanted to show this as a reminder that a theory of change can help you answer the why part of the question of what are you doing and why. And in the training, we walked through the main components of a theory of change, meaning the problem or need, the context, the solutions, and how to add depth to your theory of change using an equity lens. So actually, if you go back a slide, Nicole. Um, so that you're really adding more, just more nuance to help um, articulate and, and eventually help a reader or reviewer understand the problem and need by using data and stories that highlight needs and strengths. That when you're describing the context of that problem or need, you're, you're describing your theories about the root causes and the systemic barriers that are contributing to the problem or inequity. So that then when you're describing solutions, you're, you're describing solutions to address the inequities and solutions that build on the strengths in order to address the needs that you've identified. So then on the next slide, you will see that we provided in that training an example of a written theory of change. And those materials are available on the core resources website, um, which Gisela can uh, post that link in the chat. Um, I, we do want to note that a lot of times you might see a theory of change or a logic model presented in more of a visual format, like a flow chart or just some interesting diagram. Uh, we love those kinds of visuals. Oftentimes, just like in terms of doing the thinking exercise and really kind of fleshing out, okay, what is our theory of change? It helps to write it out like this first using the kind of um, template or worksheet that we've provided. And then you can turn it into that pretty visual after you're clear on what it is. Similarly, we also did uh, a, the training on how to develop a logic model, which really helps answer the question, what are you doing um, in addition to why? And it, you know, our kind of way of doing logic models is you know, an easier way to do it is to really answer a series of if-then questions about you know, if we have these resources, which are often called inputs, to do these activities for these participants, which are often called outputs, then we would expect, want, and hope to see these kinds of short-term, intermediate, and long-term changes. So that's in its simplest form, what a logic model is. And again, if we're applying an equity lens to developing a logic model, you'll see on the next slide, they just might get more specific about the if-then questions that you're asking uh, or they're just a variation of the questions that you're asking um, for your logic model. So in terms of your inputs, you might then ask yourself, what resources do you have or need to increase equity? So it might be things that you need more or you have bilingual and bicultural staff, that you need or you have bilingual evaluation tools, that you need or you have participants, your program participants as co-designers. So it just might, it just adds kind of a nuance and a different way of thinking about the inputs that you have. And in terms of outputs, you might be thinking about who are the, who are the participants that are impacted most by inequity. So not just who are the participants in general that would benefit from your program, but who are the participants impacted most by inequities and what activities or strategies will address the problem that you've identified and increase equity. In terms of outcomes, again, putting an equity lens on it, you might be asking yourself things like what results will tell you that the activities or strategies are increasing equitable health and well-being, or conversely, decreasing or closing the gaps and inequities. So again, we provide an example, a worksheet, a fillable worksheet that you can use if you need to create a logic model. And if you're feeling like, wow, this is, you know, I, I wouldn't even know actually where to begin with filling out a <laughs> worksheet or, you know, inputs and outputs are easy to figure out, but what, you know, I, I get stuck on outcomes. 
Um, one of the tools that you might find useful is the strategies and program outcomes tool. So this is another core tool that is embedded on the data share website, along with the core results menu. And we'll switch over there for a second. And uh, Nicole, do you want me to share my screen as we do the sure. walkthrough? Sure. Okay. So core results menu is a tool that we developed to accompany the uh, core conditions. I'm not gonna walk through that in detail today, but just wanna point out this tool here, connect strategies and program outcomes to the core conditions. This is really a tool just to help guide, again, your thought process as you think about your strategies to really, you know, as you, if you start with this question, where are you focusing your efforts? Are you focusing your efforts on people, on organizations and systems, on places and communities, or the public and political will? And it could be all of these things. But each one of these, if you click on it, it'll expand and then provide some more ways of thinking about this and some examples and some sample language that you could even use as you are developing your logic model and trying to think about you know, even activities Right. And we've just grouped them here into these broad categories. And they're slightly different, whether you're focusing on people versus organizations and systems. So this might be your own organization. It might be kind of the system or organizations outside of your own organization. If your work is focused on places and communities, again, that's a different way of talking about the kinds of activities that you might engage in. We've listed, listed examples here, same thing with public and political will. Because we realize that not every, you know, some of you might be applying for programs that involve direct services, kind of the traditional way we think of direct services, and then others might be doing things that fit more like community organizing or advocacy or uh, cross-sector collaboration. And so we want to, you know, this this menu here provides a lot of different examples that we think about like a menu where you kind of pick and choose, you know, what is relevant, what's useful to you. And then it's there's a similar format down here to help you think about outcomes. And we've, we've grouped them by short-term outcomes, the thing that, the types of things that you would expect to be able to measure and see some kind of change that is, more directly related to the program or service this service that you've provided. So something that is more likely to happen in the short term, directly related to the program or service you've provided, those are usually things like changes in awareness or knowledge, people's attitudes and beliefs, or even skills. So again, we've provided some language here about how you might phrase, kind of like starter phrases for your outcomes versus the intermediate outcomes, things that happen, sometimes it takes longer to be able to measure these kinds of changes or see these changes occur. Um, sometimes these are uh, more aspirational where you hope that this is eventually what happens, but depending on the design of your program, how long it lasts, how long you're actually in contact with participants, you may or, you know, it May or, it may be easier or more difficult for your program to actually measure and demonstrate that your program or service is the thing that led to that change in behavior or status. But these kinds of intermediate outcomes are still an important part of a logic model because eventually you wanna be able to connect the dots between here's what we do and why the activities for whom, this is what we think we can measure and demonstrate that has changed as a result of that which we hope will lead to other changes if even if we, our program, can't directly measure them. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there just to see, I'm gonna stop my screen share, just to see if there are any questions so far about how a theory of change and logic model and the strategies and program outcomes menu might help you actually answer that first set of questions about what you're proposing to do. Cheryl, see a hand up. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, Nicole, I just wanted to let you know that just yesterday we used your training from last week 
on theory of change and logic models, and we had an off an all day off site. I think last week I talked about um, being deeply committed to that process, and I just wanted to a little bit report out, which there's a buried question in there. Um, it was not easy. It was definitely difficult. I do not think that our organization, I'm with the Diversity Center of Santa Cruz County, which is serves the LGBTQ plus community, multi-generational um, aspects and allied families. So um, I don't think we've had a former f formal theory of change. And I think the logic models that have been used um, have not been as constructive, perhaps, as, as um, necessary in the sophistication of application these days. So our team is a team of nine folks, um, and we worked through it. I, I will say that the tools you provided were very useful. It provided me the ability to facilitate something that I'm not an expert in. So I really appreciated both of you yesterday. Um, we are not unique in the complexity of the problems that we are trying to address. And it is um, partly the beauty of the organization and the bane of the organization. Um, and has been difficult for us to define the importance of what we do. We're fortunate enough that um, there's a general understanding, but we can't continue to rely on that. Um, we got lost in how many problems we're trying to address the complexity of the LGBTQ plus experience. We couldn't even get off of the first question of what need or problem are we trying to solve? Um, and of course, being the good um, and and very conscientious staff that I have, even the language of problem solve causes a bunch of conversation and discomfort. Um, I'm I'm literally sitting here looking at our work on the wall. Um, the buried question. Um, we. Um, appreciated how clear the examples got got the language and do you have any tips or tricks for working through what i am sure others on this call are working with in complexity i we tried to go high level high level high level high level and boy it it took every breath to try to get there is there anything you can speak into this challenge? We're we're taking up the mantle again on Tuesday. So, I mean on Thursday. So um we're we're not letting this this bone go. We are a dog with it. Um and boy, I, I was exhausted. <laughs> with that, I'll stop talking. You want to go first? Now? I'll just say, sure, thanks. Um, first of all, great to hear that. Um, you know, sorry, but not surprised to hear the degree of struggle, but great to hear that you're engaged in it and that the tools were useful to some degree. And I think you've already answered part of what I would suggest, which is that it's not a one and done thing, even if you spend a whole intense day on it. And I agree, it is exhausting just because of the concentration and focus. And, um, you know, we often talk about how after we've facilitated something like that, we are really drained because it's just it's a lot but i thought it was me nicole i'm like what's no, no, wrong no. with me like this no, morning i'm like i'm so tired <laughs> no in fact i often have a headache at the end of things like that just because i've just been like mm -hmm. <laughs> but um but it's that being said it's still it's so worthwhile because the questions that your that your colleagues and and staff and board or whoever are raising are are really worth discussing. You may not resolve all of them, but they need to be surfaced. And it's the 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 beauty and the bane of these tools is that they are testing assumptions, and assumptions aren't always shared. And it's it's also just um, it's really useful to try to get to some consensus about the 
the scope and parameters of what you're all about. Because all of the things that are represented in our core universe, um, because they're so focused on redressing wrongs and um, and supporting people who've experienced a lot of inequities, um, they're hard. And they're not going to happen because of one organization's efforts, which is part of why we focus on collective action. And so I just would urge you to not get frustrated because just because you are finding out that you need to maybe narrow the view of where your contributions are most um, helpful to the cause, most um, immediate, where you have the best match of your skills and talents and expertise with whatever you see as needing to be done, you don't have to do all of it. That's part of the point. Um, choose, play to your strengths, you know, shore up your weaknesses, um, figure out where you are uh, best able to contribute as an organization. And that can change over time, different mix of people, different set of resources. But the point of these tools, theory of change and logic model, especially when used in tandem, is that they can give you that sort of script of here's our lane. We picked it for these reasons. We are really good at this part of it. We know we need to do more of X because nobody else is doing it and we see the need and we're going to try to do that in this way. And it just it has some, I guess what I would call explanatory power. Here's why we're here. Here's why we're doing what we're doing. Here's what we think is going to happen because we're doing what we're doing really well. And here's what else we want to do. And, you know, those are really important things to grapple with, because if you don't, then you're doing everything all the time and not necessarily well. So that's my pep talk. Hang in there. Keep at it. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> Anything to add, Nicole? Um. One of my, I agree with everything Nicole Lesson just said. And, you know, one of my um, favorite phrases when I'm facilitating these kinds of processes is, uh, is it good enough for now? So it's mm -hmm. kind of like, because sometimes we get stuck in the, like, is it perfect wording? Does it say exactly what we want it to? Is everybody going to, and sometimes like that's what can keep you stuck because, you know, especially if you, um, I mean, I, I think it's good to talk through Things like what do specific words mean to us? Does it mean the same thing? Is that the word we want to use? Like those are good conversations to have. And then also there's a certain point where it can be like, okay, are we getting in our own way? Because we are, you know, <laughs> and I and I say this as someone who can often get in my own way by having those discussions. Like at what point do we really, really need to keep talking about like, is this the exact right language and wording and scope versus is it good enough for now? Does it capture our broad thinking, uh, is it good enough to allow us to move on to the next step? Using things, I don't, I don't know how you've, um, did your discussion the other day or what your plans are for tomorrow, but sometimes even things like, um, if you're doing it, I guess it could work virtually also using things like post-its to be able to sort. It's kind of like, these are all the things that we can like hold that truth that all of these things are important. And if we had to make some choices today about what to focus on first, meaning like if we don't focus on that thing, like nothing else matters or like nothing else will gain traction. Like what are those two or three things? Like set those, like physically set those aside, right? So like it just helps create that sense of, yes, all of this can be true. And here's where we're going to focus. And then like Nicole said, to really be able to articulate, here's what we do and why, here's our, you know, this is our specialty um, or it's an unmet need or whatever it might be. I, I love that. And um, I'm going to play this back at the beginning of our session, I think, for the team. Uh, and, and Nicole, what you said, I, I will say um, for advising anybody on the call who are listening to it, who might want to do some similar things. We did end up doing the backwards approach, which was another recommendation you had in those slides. And um, <clears throat> we're very fortunate. We have a graduate student researcher who ended up <clears throat> taking over because their, their role over the last couple of years working on their PhD has been to develop theories of change and some logic models. 
And so what they did, which was very helpful, is we had pages of stuff, right? So they had us go through and we did colored dots by everything. Things can have more than one color, but to take groupings and then just to list a grouping and then distill to the common denominator in a two-step process. And we were able to get through one entire grouping. So by the end of it, I think we ended up having... Because also your um, recommendation for logic models is not to have more than three to five programs. We're also, our programs are um, populations. They're not programs. We can't have a program that's a youth program. That's, that's, that, that's not the spirit of a program necessary. It's who we're addressing. So um, we're boiling down, to, we're, we're redefining those three to five programs. And what was really helpful is it started to look like we had three to five categories in working in that backwards logic model um, sort of way so that we work back up to a theory of change. So for anybody getting stuck. I I will say, Nicole, what you said is where we finally started to get some traction. And that's where we're picking up on Thursday. Awesome. I might have to have you all back as like a guest speaker in a future (laughs) coffee chat about real life. (laughs) We'll see, huh? Real life case study. (laughs) If we get that core grant, we'll see if we did it right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I saw, was it Denise? Did you also, or Carol, I forget which one of you also had a hand up a moment ago. I had a hand up, but I think Cheryl encapsulated it. We went through a very similar process uh, about a year and a half ago when we were redefining, we redid our vision, mission, and values and our strategic planning. And so I was just going to say like, Cheryl got there, but I was just going to say what we did was we had programs do it individually. And then we looked at the common thread. And that's what we used to develop because it was very hard. We have very uh, diverse programs at our nonprofit. So it was hard to find that common thread. But when we had the programs do kind of their theory of change individually, and then we reviewed them as a group, we did find some common threads and were able to use that. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Anyone wants to share before we wrap up this part? When you think about either what you've experienced yourselves, creating theories of change and logic models or um, what you've seen or heard me just describe, and then when you think about the questions you'll have to address in the application, do you feel like this, this gives you some good tools and ideas about how to go about answering those questions? Or does anyone feel like, yeah, I still wouldn't know where to begin? Okay, I'm going to take that as you're feeling good to go and you'll reach out for help if you're if you're getting stuck. So we're going to turn to some other tools that can be helpful in answering this part of the RFP, these questions. And we're going to start with the core continuum of results and evidence. And yes, that acronym is deliberate. Um, The core continuum is a bilingual tool that's downloadable from the core results menu page on DataShare. And Gisela is putting a link in the chat. And this is the tool that's particularly relevant and is specifically asked about in question seven of the RFP, which wants you to place your program somewhere on this continuum. And so we just wanna remind everyone, as Nicole said earlier, this your answer to this question is not scored. It's purely informational. So the options for placement of your program is, it starts with an emerging um, idea or program, something that is a good idea, something that's an effective practice, or something that's an evidence-based practice. And we will go through what these mean and how you can use this tool to figure that out. So an emerging program means one that has not really been evaluated yet. 
So maybe you are trying something, you've gotten some positive feedback, but it's still pretty anecdotal. You, there's nothing systematic or structured necessarily about how you've collected information about the program. You're just trying to see what you can learn about it. But maybe you have done some kind of informal evaluation, like a survey or a set of focus groups, and that might be transitioning from something that you're just trying as an emerging idea to something that you have some insights about why it is a good idea. What you thought was a good idea, turns out it probably is a good idea. And here's how you think that you know that because you've made some kind of early progress. Or maybe it's an effective practice, which means that there's been some more formal evaluation as opposed to informal evaluation. And you are starting to gather some, some data, some insights, some information that yes, you can attribute some positive outcome or outcomes of what you're doing um, to your effort. And then there's evidence-based practice, um, which you may recognize the acronym EBP. And that's the one that has the most um, rigorous formal research behind it and some level of statistical significance, usually because that program approach has been compared to something else, to another version of the approach or to, to not doing that program. So we can't say often enough, these are all points along a continuum. We are not assigning a value that any one of these is better than any other. The goal rather is to be clear, to have clarity about where you are and where you might like to be if that's different. Everything that's that's now an evidence-based program and shows up on clearing houses and uh, lists of um, things that funders want to invest in started out as an emerging idea. So those are um, not value judgments. They're just where are you on this continuum? And knowing where you are on the continuum can also help you think about the metrics for what kinds of data you want, might want to collect in the future. If you're interested in moving from one part of this to another, which you may or may not be, um, then you might have some questions about, well, what else do I need to know? What other kinds of data can I gather um, to make that decision? So let's take a more careful look at each of these. And in the, uh, the tool, the, the core continuum um, PDF that you have a link to, you can see more of this information. It's again, both English and Spanish in there. So you can see that there are some methods for gathering the information in, in the emerging category. So you might have observed something, or as I mentioned earlier, have some anecdotal feedback from, from people who are receiving the services or, or maybe some other way of gathering information. It's very informal at this stage. And because of that, this the information about an emerging uh, program or activity is not likely to be shared or available in a public realm like data share. It's probably something internal to a program or team. And here's that same information in Spanish. So you're more likely to be at this emerging column of um, activities if you're asking or asking yourself or saying things like, I wonder what would happen if we tried X, Y, or Z, or what I've been doing before, this, those approaches aren't solving the issue. What, what can we do that, that hasn't been done before that might be different from that? And then when you're gathering information to answer those questions, you might be using them to answer things like, should we keep doing this? Is it worth doing? Um, should we do more of it? Is it? If so, how much more should we do? And what other data or evidence should we be collecting with an equity lens just for our own purposes and then later on to add to the evidence base? So what, what are we trying to learn here? That's true of all of these. What do we wanna know and how are we gonna use the information that we collect? So here's the 
emerging questions in Spanish. And then moving on to the good idea set of questions. Here, you might have some of the same types of um, methods to collect information as you did for an emerging uh, program or idea, observations, anecdotal feedback, but you might back that up with some more forms or tools that track um, specific things about it. So how many activities, how many participants are showing up to different sessions, what is the rate of participation? Is that sustained over time? Those kinds of things. So you're still informal, but here maybe some of the information you're collecting is starting to find its way into a more public realm. Maybe it's in a report that you're sharing or a presentation that you've made to funders or something like that. And here's that same information in Spanish. And then if you are trying to move yourself um, around this category of a good idea and thinking about whether or not your program is here, it's because you're asking yourself questions like, we seem to be reaching the right number and types of people and our informal feedback is indicating that we're on the right track. It's worth continuing to do this. But how do we really know that? What kinds of data might help us convey more about the importance of this approach? And as you're collecting those uh, data from forms and tools in a more uh, systematic way across your program, you might be asking, you might be using that data to ask yourself, would this work on a broader scale? What if we did more of this program in more places for more people in more situations or sustained it in a different way? And then you're always asking yourself, what else should we be collecting or reviewing with an equity lens? And here's that same information in Spanish. And for an effective practice, again, all of the above methods, but now you're moving into things that might be um, case studies might have a lot more structure to them, um, interviews where you're asking the same questions to a lot of different people, focus groups where you're convening people to discuss and explore something, um, surveys of various kinds. Maybe you, you're sitting on some administrative data about your program, either because you're having to report something to a funder or you're using some kind of billing system where you have to track things. So, so you're starting to get into more, more data more systematically collected, and more to work with. So this is getting more formal, more structured. It's probably available in some public realm, more so than the other two that we've just discussed. And here's that same information in Spanish. And here, you might decide that the information that you're collecting is fine. Um, that's all of the proof or evidence that you need um, or that you have the time and resources to produce. Totally fine. Uh, many funders and policymakers just want to know whether a funded program or practice produced the results that, that were intended, maybe something that was in your logic model, for example. Um, you're also trying to understand, did anybody's lives or circumstances change for the better. Um, again, if, if your logic model and evaluation plan are, are pointing you in that direction, they'll also tell you more about what you want to measure and how to report those outcomes, which is great. Um, but maybe you as a service provider or a funder or a policymaker might decide that it's really important to um, adopt a program or an approach that's already been through some steps of evaluation um, and assessment. And in that case, you'd be moving towards something that's evidence-based. And something that's defined as an evidence-based program or practice has the most data behind it and the most formal data, the most rigorous. So it might include all the things we've talked about, but sometimes it might have a really extensive 
randomized controlled trial or RCT. So that's when you're really testing something against a hypothesis of this community or group or neighborhood had this intervention and this other one didn't. And then we compare the two and figure out what's different about them. Um, this, this type of, of um, program, an evidence-based program, is very likely to have information in the public domain about whether it worked and why and how, what the elements of it are that others could replicate. And that's part of the point so that it's, it's scaled up um, and other people can follow it, a, a curriculum, a toolkit, a guide to doing exactly the same thing and achieving very similar or same results. So this is the same information here in Spanish about evidence-based practices. And you might be at this point, if you're asking yourself or saying things like, I know the research shows that this program that I'm implementing has improved the same or similar outcomes or impacts that we have in our logic model. So you're actually looking for something that matches what you're trying to do, maybe with the same population, the same goals. And then you're asking, is there enough of that type of research with an equity lens to, to justify that assertion? Are we gonna get those results? Or what's different about our community that might affect, what variables might affect whether we get the same results as the designers of this program did? And what else should we be collecting or reviewing or analyzing to do our own assessment um, to see how well we uh, matched up with the results that others are finding. Because it might be that you're, you're, you can do uh, something that yields even better results and then whatever innovation you had is contributing to the evidence base and becomes the evidence base program of the future. So here's that same information in Spanish. So at this point, we're just curious, just based on what we've reviewed and what you know or what your gut is telling you, where would you currently place your program on the core continuum? Is it emerging? Is it a good idea? Is it an effective program or practice? Or is it evidence-based? So just let us know in answering the poll, totally non-binding, just, just to see. I think we got our responses, Nicole, so I'll end it and okay. share the results. Okay. So we've got a, a good idea and an EVP, it looks like. Okay. Thanks for that. Questions about this uh, tool or using it to answer question seven? Okay, not seeing any, but feel free to ponder and add something in the chat. We can come back to it later too, if you don't have anything formulated right now. So we'll move on then to another tool, um, which is about how to develop the, um, the Smarty outcomes and getting ready to collect data about them. So we're gonna talk about some ways to describe the outcomes of your program's activities, which should also give you some ideas about, about data um, in each of these categories that we've got here. And we like to think about, um, you know, there, there's so many different ways to slice and dice the metrics that you might be using to measure your own progress you may have come across these terms already and be familiar with them, but borrowed from the world of evaluation, 
Some common terms are process measures, and those tend to focus on the actual process of delivering your services and different activities that are related to them. And then there are outcome measures that look at the results, and those can be uh, further divided into short-term, medium-term, and longer-term measures. So we're looking at what's realistic to achieve in certain time frames. So maybe a year from now, for example, a few years down the road, or even a longer time frame out like a decade. And then all of those activities and outcomes hopefully gather some momentum, and then ultimately will have a greater impact in the long run. And that's the ultimate change that results from your efforts. And all of these could be things that you're asked to describe in a grant proposal, an evaluation, and of course they show up in our beloved logic models. <laughs> And so um, you've heard us talk a lot, a lot, a lot about logic models. And many of you are also familiar with similar frameworks that use this type of language like results-based accountability or RBA. RBA is also part of the core RFP, you may have noticed, but even when the terms differ slightly, they're really essentially asking the same questions. How much of something is happening or what are the concrete outputs that we can observe and measure about it? How well is it happening? Or how can we track and improve quality? And of course, the ultimate question, is anybody actually better off because of our activities, which is why we're doing all this in the first place? And so just keep in mind that the focus on whether anyone is better off in data collection, evaluation, or any other effort, it's not just to measure success, but also to learn, to learn from when we fall short, when we don't meet our goals, so that programs and activities can be tweaked and improved. It's, it's not a gotcha sort of thing, even if it may feel that way when this question is asked. And in the core RFP and many others, you're also asked to describe your goals in various ways, such as SMART or SMARTY goals, SMART is an acronym that stands for specific, measurable, ambitious, or achievable, depending on your interpretation or possibly your funder's interpretation of this acronym, and time-bound. And so recently, as we've discussed, um, SMART goals have been expanded in a good way to uh, be more inclusive and equitable, and that's also the case in the core RFP. So we're going to share a tool in a moment um, from which this example is drawn, but it's an example of how a perfectly fine SMART goal can be strengthened by adding inclusion and equity dimensions. So for example, if your goal is building a volunteer team of 100 door-to-door -door canvassers by May, that's specific. You know exactly what it is. It's measurable. You'll reach your goal of 100 or some other number lower or higher. It's either ambitious or achievable, depending on how hard it is to build that volunteer team. It's realistic. Maybe you've got a track record of doing this very thing, or maybe you're stretching to achieve this, but it's still doable. And it's time-based because you want to finish by May in this example. But when you add that you're going to focus on recruiting at, le at least 10 people of color first, you've added inclusion and equity to the goal. And you've also potentially changed the outcome because you're not just recruiting people of color, but intending to do so in order to shape the way that you're undertaking the work itself, which in this case is canvassing. The designers of this example, the Management Center, have noted how important it is when adding inclusion and equity dimensions to think about power, the power of those included to really actually shape outcomes. The resource that we're sharing in the chat um, has more guidance about how to embed inclusion and equity in your goals. And they've also got a really helpful goals bank that can stimulate some ideas on language and scope if you're feeling stuck. But again, it's just it's not just the the inclusion and equity for um, 
for the sake of just asking people something, but really using their input to shape what's happening and to have them included in a meaningful way. Any questions about this? Well, that's good because that means you're ready to try it. So we are hoping that you can take a few minutes while we're together to go through the Smarty Goals worksheet. And then we'll talk about how that went. Um, we hope this really helps you just walk through something that will be um, of use in responding to those RFP questions as well as other purposes. Let us know if you have any questions before diving in and then we'll just spend, what do you think, Nicole, five minutes? 10 minutes? I'll start with five and then just see where we are after that. And yeah. um, and so just to just to explain on the for the video, the Smarty Goals worksheet was sent out as an attachment, the editable word version, and then the link that Gisela just put in the chat a while ago with the Google, it's a Google link, contains a copy of the Smarty worksheet in English and Spanish. You basically would have to, I think you, because it's set to view only, I think you'd have to either download it so you can edit it or make a copy of it so you can edit it. Um, so I put it in the chat as the link to the English in the English version of it in Google. Great, thanks. Well, Denise, no pressure, but I don't have anyone else to call on. Am um, I the only person typing in? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Do, um, do you have questions or or do you want to share anything about? Um, so I just started working through it um, on goals that I already currently have, just trying to place them into the worksheet. Um, yeah, I don't have any, I don't have any questions. Am I the only person left on the call? Afraid so. I looked up <laughs> and all of a sudden after I was presenting. Everyone was, everyone was all, uh, ask. No, thank you. <laughs> um, no, I like the Smarty. I haven't actually heard of Smarty before. I've heard of Smart Goals, but I haven't done the Smarty before. So what I started working on was we need to get our early education center fully staffed. And so I started plugging that goal in. And then I started thinking about like, what is my actual goal? My actual goal is to hire staff who are hired at a livable wage that are also bilingual to represent the participants that we serve. So that's what I started like processing and thinking about in there. It's not one of my goals for the core grant, but it's just one of my goals. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Still counts. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't have any questions. I, I like this though. I'm going to bring it back to my team because I don't think they've heard of Smart Eagles either. Yeah, it's um, it, we're finding that it's new information for a lot of people, but also it makes sense it's instinctively. Yeah. And um, so it's um, it's nice that the core RFP can be the forefront of introducing people to this. So yes, we hope to um, see a lot more. Yeah. Um, was there other slides to the presentation? Because you can keep going with that. Okay. Um, yeah. We do have just and, a few other slides, but they're of a wrap up nature. And Nicole, maybe before yeah. you move on, that um, just a couple of things to that came to mind to me also right now. Like sometimes it might be easier also to start even even though, like Denise, you just said a moment ago that the goal around hiring bilingual staff isn't necessarily what you'll put in the core application. Totally fine. And sometimes it's easier to start with something yeah. that feels more familiar that you've been kind of noodling on. And then, because really in the application, um, they'll actually want you to, to identify outcome, like smarty outcomes. Okay. And so even um, kind of the phrasing of like hiring staff, for instance, like if you, you know, if someone were thinking of including that in their proposal, 
like then there would still be a step of thinking about, okay, how do I phrase that as an outcome versus just the, here's the thing I'm going to do, which is more of like a process measure. And so the example that we were showing on the slide from that Smarty worksheet is, you know, they, and they even call it a Smarty goal. So it's more of like a, here's what we aim to do versus here's the change or result that we hope will come of it. Even the example in the RFP is a little bit more processy than <laughs> outcome. <laughs> and so it's just okay. something like uh, just a tip to kind of, as you're thinking about this for your application, thinking about how do you frame your outcomes, the concept still applies. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, it's a great point. Thanks, Nicole. All right, let me go back to our resources slide. And Denise, these may be familiar to you by now too, but for others uh, who might be seeing this um, not live in the recording, um, some resources that were mentioned today are um, the core local progress page on data share Santa Cruz County, the uh, Smarty Goals worksheet, which we've just been discussing. And then another resource that um, is not specific to core, but or the RFP, but the National Collaborative on Childhood Childhood Obesity Research has an evaluation toolkit that has a lot of really valuable um, framing of outcomes, of strategies, of activities, um, different kinds of process and outcome measures. So similar to the outcome and strategies tool that Nicole reviewed um, that's on the core local progress page on data share, along with the continuum of results and evidence, it can give you some ideas about language and level of detail. And just if you're feeling stuck about um, conceptually thinking about outcomes um, and how to talk about the measures of them, can be just a starting place to give you some ideas. And Denise, one more chance to ask any questions you may have. I'm good, thank you. Okay, thanks. Nicole mentioned some of these at the outset, the um, applicant conference where um, staff from HSD will walk through the RFP and answer some questions um, during that session is on June 21st from 10 to 12. And then there'll be another training um, similar to this one that'll be specifically on trying to use uh, data share and other sources for community level data. That'll be on the 25th and it'll be followed on the 26th by a session that's um, specifically about using the online portal for the core RFP. So whether you've used that particular portal or others, um, if you just wanna check in on that one to see if there's anything that might require some extra preparation on your part, uh, might be a good idea too. And, and that will be recorded as well. And all of these, um, you can sign up for them on the core RFP uh, website. In July, um, there'll be another set of core RFP office hours. And just a reminder, these are the informal, not recorded sessions that don't have a presentation on our part, but we're just gathering together to talk through any questions you wanna bring to that. They're, they're, each hour is focused on a specific core condition. Um, so if you just have some questions about that are related to the core condition and wanna hear what others might be thinking or asking about as well, that's a chance to try to talk through some of those together. On the 9th, there'll be a training that's specific to preparing the program budget and budget narrative part of the RFP response. Um, and that one will be from 10 to 12 in the morning. And we'll have some opportunities to just, just like we did today, walk through those specific questions, think about how to fill out those specific parts of the RFP, the forms, um, 
answer as many questions as possible about how to do that and provide some examples and practice during that session. And then finally on the 12th, there will be a sort of a tour of the highlights from all of these trainings for those who missed the live trainings or haven't had a chance to listen to the recordings in detail and just wanna, or might wanna refresh or even if you were there or did have a chance to listen to those. And that should be it. Nicole, over to you. Our last request is to please share your feedback about today's training. It um, is helpful for us to have a sense of what worked well, what was useful, as well as anything that we could improve for the remainder of the training sessions, especially since we still have a few more to go. Um, so you can either uh, click on the link that Gisela put in the chat or if you have a smartphone with a camera app, you can scan the QR code and it takes you to the survey. You can answer it in either English or Spanish. And we'll also send out a, uh, an email right after this session, just with a reminder to fill out the survey as well. And then we will share the links to the recordings and all the materials and resources that we shared today. We will send that in a follow-up email it usually takes us a few days to be able to get that ready um, because we need to make sure the videos and the slides are um, pass all the standards for the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that actually takes us a little bit of time to do. I think that brings us to the end. And so um, I wanna thank you for staying on through the end. The others had other meetings that they had to leave to get to, but. It was, it was nice to have a small group and be able to have, um, not feel so rushed. So thank you. Right, thank, thank you, Denise. You. Thank you, Stella and Gisela for being here and assisting us as always. And Crystal. Thanks. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Dude, you we'll too. See you next time.